And welcome back. We are getting started with chapter six today, which is port scanning. So we're going to look at how to identify uh, some common information gathering tools and techniques. And our concepts for the day are going to be determining a network range, a block of IPs or hosts in a given um, system, identifying active machines, mapping open ports, operating system fingerprinting, and network mapping. Uh, some of the stuff we've mentioned before, this is just going to give us a little bit more depth. So when we determine the network range of a particular organization, we're trying to gather information about what IPs it uses. And these may not necessarily be contiguous, but they usually are going to be. This means that your port scanning is going to be more accurate and effective because we're only scanning the IP addresses of the intended victim. And it's also going to be computationally much faster because we're losing um, any scan ranges that would be unnecessary. We don't have to do this huge broad range. Ineffective scans can also set off detection measures. So if we have probes going into the middle of nowhere and we get these weird bounce backs, that may cause us to think that we have traffic uh, accessible to us that isn't part of the network we're targeting. And we can have specific uh, ports that may be acting as honeypots that we want to be aware of that we can help to circumvent by accurately identifying these ranges. So we're looking for live hosts, meaning that they're devices that are powered on, connected to the network and accessible their IP addresses and open ports. We're looking for operating systems. We're looking for different things to indicate the architecture of the system. We're also um, looking at services. You know, is something running a mail exchanger or another type of web service? Uh, and then any kind of vulnerabilities that we could probably pull. So identifying these machines can be done in a number of different ways. Um, war dialing used to be back in the modem days, which is where you would just kind of go down the list of um, known numbers that would be trying to access remote dial-ins. Um, Telnet used to have a similar aspect to that. War driving. This is where we actually will take a um, wireless antenna and try and drive around to be able to locate open uh, AP entrances. Also trying to determine the physical range of an AP from a particular building. Uh, pinging, which as we know is just sending a Marco Polo game between two IP addresses. And then port scanning, where we're actually looking for whether or not a particular port is actively receiving or filtering information. So, um, as I said, war dialing was kind of antiquated, but the idea was you would pick a town at random and dial a range of phone numbers uh, to turn up computers with modems attached based on the response points. And the same general idea can be applied to some newer items, uh, but it's largely much more focused on data as opposed to calling access numbers because nobody really has to quote unquote dial in anymore. Now you could use war dialing if you knew that there was like a legacy aux signal that was uh, available at a particular company as a uh, most likely unmonitored backdoor. So as I said with war driving, you know, we, we would normally have like a laptop with an antenna, but you can also have a GPS receiver, software, um, that's embedded on something like a, a Raspberry Pi. There's things that have battery power now that don't have to haul around. Um, you know, these, these big bulky laptops, and you know, bulk laptops aren't that crazy, but considering that you're trying to keep yourself as mobile as possible, um, you really don't want to have to mess with um, inaccessibility. Um, this is war walking, war jogging, war biking, war flying. There's a number of different things. Um, there's, there's drones that have um, war driving materials attached. It's important to understand that war driving is successful because personnel will sometimes install their own access points on a network without company permission. This is called a rogue AP. An individual who installs an AP in such a way will have likely no knowledge or consideration of good security practices and the access point may be completely unsecured which means that people could intrude upon it very easily. To defend against war driving, we've got tools like Air Snort, uh, Air Snare, Kismet, Net Stumbler. All of these different items can actually be used to detect potential intrusions. You'll notice the item intrusion detection system come up quite a bit when we're talking about these. Pings are used to determine whether or not a system is active. So if we send an internet control echo request, a properly configured system will then send back a reply and that reply will give us information such as um, response time, time to live, things like that so we can have an idea of where this particular host is relative to us. 
If we want to look at advanced pinging, we can look at things like HPing. This is a command line based tool uh, for TCP IP scanning and packet crafting. You can actually custom write your own packets to be able to try and get specific results. This is great for auditing, firewall testing, um, manual MTU discovery, maximum transmission unit, how big a frame can be, uh, route tracing, operating system fingerprinting, uptime guessing, stack auditing, and so forth. Stack auditing, by the way, is just the uh, the development stack for a particular web-based service. Like um, Facebook was originally, but may still be, built on the LAMP stack, using different things to be able to interface with a user and be able to create a responsive environment. So just some commands that you can see here, um, different types of scans, like a standard ICMP scan, uh, ACK scan, UDP scan, specific ports, looking for a sequence number, uh, doing a SYN flood. Um, different flags being triggered on a uh, TCP frame. Port scanning is where we're trying to discover services based on what ports are open because certain services run on certain ports. That's part of how we have standardized traffic. So this scan is designed to probe ports by sending in, you know, just kind of a test packet to see whether or not there's any response. And this is very effective for getting host information. So if we probe certain ports and we get a response back or we get a particular type of response, we can identify whether a port is open, closed, or filtered, uh, meaning that it is currently being able to accept traffic but has a very specific type of um, acceptable traffic that it will take as opposed to being able to reject it based on content. So there's a number of different scan techniques that are involved. Um, TCP connect scan, send scan, fin scan, null scan, ax scan. Um, flags in the TCP header are used to describe the status of a packet and the communication that goes with it. And when these flags are set by means of a bit being set from zero to one, they describe a specific behavior. So this allows penetration testers or attackers to be able to make packets that are designed to gain information. So the connect scan, is the most reliable, but it's the easiest to detect. It's easily logged because we create a full connection. When we say a full connection, we're talking about the three-way handshake of synchronization, synchronization acknowledgement, and acknowledgement before the transmission begins. Open ports will reply with a SYNAC, and closed ports will respond with a reset ACK. Um, so again, when we start having these combinations of flags, this tells us some information about the status of that particular system. A SYN scan is a uh, half open scan because full TCP connection is not established, so we don't finish the handshake. This was built to be more stealthy in evade IDS systems, though most modern systems are now adapted to reject it. Um, open ports will bounce back a SYN ACK and closed ports will send a reset ACK, very much like we have with the connect scan. FIN scan, this is trying to detect a port by sending a request to close a non-existent connection. So we go ahead and send a fin packet to a target port. Um, if we have a null scan, this is designed to send packets with no flags set. Uh, and again, different systems will respond in different ways. A ACK scan attempts to determine access control list rule sets or identify if we have what's called stateless inspection. If an ICMP destination is unreachable, the port's considered to be filtered. Um, and then whenever we perform another type of ag scan, it'll send packets to a target port with flags set in combinations that are illegal or illogical. So if we have, you know, finish, push, and urgent uh, in different combinations, we can see that um, if it's configured correctly, it'll respond in a certain way or not. Usually, if it's a closed port, it'll give us a reset. Reset's kind of the default. So here we have a little bit of explanation of the different flag types, um, synchronization, acknowledgement, um, finish flag, reset, push, urgent. Um, we've seen this before, but again, we just wanna make sure we, we refresh ourselves on that. There's two uh, extras we wanna be aware of, which is the uh, CWR, congestion window reduce, and then the ECE, which is the ECN echo flag. If we're looking for half open connections, you know, we've got that half, half scan or stealth scan. Um, it's important to be able to understand with the dash n dash p parameter for netstat what it would look like. So we can see here in the table, we've got the first two that say establish. As we look at the last seven or so, we see that it says sin received, but it's just kind of chilling. It's sitting there. 
it's got a foreign address that's trying to climb through 10, 25, 26, 27, 28, 29, and 30. So we have a half open connection, increasing ports all from the same source. Definitely seems like there's an active sin attack going on. Now you will generally not see this because these connections are, they're computer responses, so they're much faster than we would uh, need. But in general, this means that we do have the ability to look at these connections and identify stuff that is not quite right. So how do we go against this stuff? How do we block port scanning? Well, we have what's called the deny all approach, which is where we block traffic to all ports unless it is specifically manually approved. Um, the proper design structure, which means that we have to go through and create um, a set of rules for the firewall or whatever else that are specifically going to um, allow traffic as needed flexibly, but are very rigorous in terms of how they intake that traffic, what they do. Usually stateful inspection is involved, meaning that it identifies the, uh, the content of the message, not just the status. Firewall testing uh, is a way to test the capability of a firewall to be able to detect and block undesirable traffic. And this usually means we have to sit down during the setup process and fire a lot more test traffic at it. Using um, owner controlled port scanning where we use the same tools an attacker would use and see what the response is. And if we can see that our ports are vulnerable for whatever reason, you know, run an open boss scan or things like that, we can have an identity uh, profile to say our system is um, proofed against these general attacks. Um, now, obviously, we don't want to consider it to be completely proofed, but we want it to be um, focusing on the vulnerabilities rather than the stuff that's coverage. And then last, but of course not least, is security awareness training. It teaches employees how to look for stuff that seems weird, you know, anything that stands out. Maintain security, encourage security policies, understand why security policies exist. Um, there's an adage that says you catch more flies with honey than vinegar, meaning that by being um, positive, you generally get a better response. Well, there's a corollary to that, which is when you give people a set of rules and you just say, obey the rules or else, that tends to get a negative response because people don't understand why they're being inconvenienced. There's an inversely proportional relationship between security and convenience, this we know. As security goes up, convenience decreases. So whenever we're looking at this, we have to remember that if we tell people the reason behind the rules, if we give them an explanation of why this particular policy exists, compliance becomes better because they understand why. Um, I'm not saying that you should have to sit down and, and give all of these employees a full master class on security structure and things like that, but if they understand the general idea of um, don't leave your password on a sticky note and hope that nobody goes through your desk, um, you know, if you just say that, hopefully, logically, they'll catch it. But if you say, hey, this is a really high level of vulnerability because, you know, for whatever reason, these people could come through, people could come in pretending to do audits, uh, you know, somebody could be disgruntled, blah, 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 blah. So awareness is absolutely critical because you've got so many different endpoints that you have to be aware of. Computers follow the rules implicitly. That's what they're designed to do. People can make decisions that are outside of that range. And I wanted to go ahead and go over a couple of tools with you um, for being able to map open ports. Now, two of these, SuperScan and ScanRand, are not currently maintained um, as of the last time I looked anyway. Uh, it was around you know, 2015 to 2017 that both of those tools were still being actively monitored. But they are still out there. You can download older versions of them and use them in order to perform tests. Um, you know, sometimes just, you know, easy open source stuff can be handy. Um, SuperScan, of course, is, is closed source. We'll take a look at that in a moment. Uh, but THC AMAP and NMAP still very much active to my knowledge. NMAP is probably the most widely used security tool uh, that I'm aware of as far as being able to scan systems and it, it does all kinds of different scans. It has a scripting uh, engine that's built in and it's available on all major operating systems of which I'm aware. This is a command line application. If you want the GUI version, you can download it. It's called ZenMap, um, which is very much the same thing. It just gives you a, a GUI interface to work with. I'm not as big a fan of that simply because if you, 
whenever you're constructing your queries, you want to make sure you know what you're asking for rather than just kind of clicking the button. And the customization that's inherent in working in a command line tends to be more desirable. If you want to perform an nmap scan at the Windows command prompt using the CLI, you type in nmap, whatever the address is, and then your option flags. And the option flags are vast, my people. If you go to nmap's website and you go through the manual, the man pages, um, it's, it's deep. You can go way, way deep. Just to give you an example, if we were to do a nmap-st scan uh, for the address 192.168.123.254, this is the text response that it'll give us. It'll tell us what version we're starting. Uh, it'll tell us what the day and time is. It'll tell us what our time zone is. And it'll give us information about the ports as given. So we can see whether or not certain things are open or closed. In this case, we can see FTP and HTTP are open. Um, almost 1,700 ports are filtered. Uh, here is the MAC address for that particular interface, and it tells us how long it takes for the scan to be performed. In this case, it took almost two minutes uh, to run through 1,700 plus ports. Now, whenever we're using NMAP, we have to be aware that there's pretty much three status types that are going to come back to us. Either open, where we're accepting connections closed, where it's not listening or accepting, and then filtered. So there's some kind of monitoring going on that is preventing the port from being fully determined. Now, from when I took my ethical hacking exam, there are six scans that I feel are pretty critical to know. We talked about these just a moment ago, but I wanted to give you some graphical representations as well as a little more detail on the first two. So the full connect or full open scan, the ST that we just looked at, um, that is a full handshake. So after the handshake is completed, that's when it goes ahead and detects our port status. It doesn't require super user privileges, which is anything beyond standard user. Um, as you can see from the graphic, you get the SYN and SYNAC uh, bouncing between the two and then the acknowledge and reset coming after the completion. If the port's closed, we get a SYN and with an immediate reset. With a half open scan, that's where we have a reset right before the scan finishes. Um, this can sometimes help in bypassing firewalls and logging mechanisms. Um, it just depends on A, timing, and B, um, completion of the um, acknowledgement sequence. Inverse flag, uh, which is where we have fin, urge, push, uh, or no flag set, which is null scanning. So any of those uh, combinations that we talked about a little bit ago in order to send a, what's called an illogical probe, that's an inverse flag. The Christmas scan, or SX, this is where you have fin, urgent, and push all active. Um, it doesn't really work on anything in Windows right now, but it will still work on um, Linux and Unix-based systems. As far as I'm aware, I haven't tested it on Mac in a while, but I have to imagine they haven't changed that much of the structure. Um, it works on operating systems that are based on the RFC 793 implementation. So if you look up um, RFC white papers, you will see what structure that is, how their stack is configured. Uh, the Mimon scan, which is named for Uriel Mimon, um, first described in FRAC Magazine, issue 49, November 1996. Um, interestingly enough, NMAP was released two issues later. So NMAP has been around for a while, but the MIMON scan is a little bit older than that. Um, it uses Finnish acknowledgement probes uh, to be able to see whether or not a port is open or closed. So you can see uh, in the graphic, when we send the FINAC, there's no response because there's no, we're trying to close uh, a non-existent uh, conversation between that and the port. If we have it happen with a closed port, it's going to bounce back a reset. So that's going to give us a little bit of a, a cleaner flag. ACK flag probes, um, just in general, are going to send TCP ACK probes and analyze the header info. So it's not necessarily the response itself, but the header of that response. If we have a time to live of less than 64, or we have a reset window of non-zero, the port is considered open. So if we look at the graphic in the bottom right, you can see that on line three, we're going to go ahead and send that reset um, header into the, 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 dump, the dump reader. We're going to go ahead and acknowledge what that content is. TTL of 64, that's normal. Reset window is 512. So that is outside of the zero that we see for lines one, two, and four. If we have a random sequence number um, that, we, that we probe and act with, no response means it's being filtered, and then reset means that there's no filtering. So kind of the inverse of a MIMON scan in terms of responses. 
SuperScan is a Windows-based port scanner designed to scan TCP and UDP, uh, do ping scans, run Whois queries, and use Traceroute. So it consolidates a lot of stuff that would already be available to you through the Windows command line, just in a convenient GUI. Um, it is closed source. It is a private uh, code program. Foundstone was absorbed by McAfee and is no longer consistently maintained, but you can find um, older versions of it to download out there. Scan Rand. Part of the Paquetto tool suite, if you look up uh, Docs Para or Dan Kaminsky, um, they will have some access to that suite. I think um, there's a couple of vulnerability sites that still mirror it. Um, not currently being maintained as far as I'm aware. I think it last left off about five years ago. It's really useful because it can scan either single host or large scan networks. Um, it uses what's called stateless scanning to run ports in parallel. And it does this by forking two distinct processes of the query into separate threads. So it'll do one thread that's running the original query, and then it has another thread that's specifically handling um, receipt and reconciliation. So rather than saying, you know, port one, take the response, process it, and spit it back, it's going to say, okay, port one, port two, port three, and it's going to fire through all of those ports and then process the materials in a, in a separate stack of memory. This is great when you have a large number of IP addresses that need to be scanned quickly, so that, that way you can get that uh, response information put in, and then you can process it on your side with a little bit more leisure behind it. THC AMAP, or the Hacker's Choice, another mapper. Um, this stores a collection of normal responses that can be provided to ports to elicit responses when a scanning service uses encryption. Uh, so again, it's a slightly more advanced version of the kinds of responses that we would craft uh, using HPing or something similar. This gives us the ability to find services that have been redirected from standard ports. So if you have what's called port forwarding active, um, I know for services like battle.net or certain um, streaming services, they actually have you do port forwarding so that, that way you can have direct access to this particular um, stream of data without leaving an open compromised channel through, you know, 80 or 8080 um, if you're accessing something through a, a login site. Now, operating system fingerprinting relies on unique characteristics that each operating system exhibits during its normal operation. All operating systems are different in terms of their construction, in terms of their operation, even ones that are forked from one another. Um, if you have things that are considered derivatives of, of one another, but they've, they've uh, varied far enough to be able to represent uh, some major changes, their responses will then, of course, be different. So the response that's given can provide clues for a well-educated guess about the system that's in place. So we go ahead and use active and passive fingerprinting to be able to probe a system to generate a response, or we can listen for uh, system communications for details. So we're going to go ahead and send crafted information into ports that were discovered during the scan to be open. Um, once we discover what the OS is, it's a lot better for us to be able to focus an attack. So that, that way we can send stuff that's specific to those vulnerabilities. If we have something running Windows 7 versus something running Windows 10 or 11, there's going to be a whole different set of uh, potential vulnerabilities. Passive fingerprinting doesn't yield results as quickly, but it lets us have an easier time of staying hidden. Um, so that, that way, you know, information is not going to necessarily be triggering the defenses. Um, active OS fingerprinting is going to contact the host directly to try and probe for information, um, usually performing what's called a banner grab. So we're going to send specially crafted packets to the target system. Remember I said HPing earlier was something we could use to craft packets. We can also use things like Xprobe2 or Nmap. Once we take those packets and we send them to the target system, the operating system bounces back a response and we see, you know, this is the likelihood. And again, it's all likelihoods. You know, there's nothing that's going to be definite unless we have uh, control of the system and then are able to self-identify a little bit more directly. With passive OS fingerprinting, we can just monitor traffic. So we look for patterns, um, significant amount of stealth as opposed to active connectivity. Uh, POF tool might be a good example of a passive fingerprinting tool. I've also used Wireshark in certain cases to be able to try and figure out information. Um, it just depends on what level of uh, scan intensity you're looking for. Then, of course, yeah, you can, you can do NMAP scans of, of several different flavors. I, I recommend very strongly that you go to nmap.org and take a look at the manual for that thing and see 
all the different customization options you can put into a single query. And then you can get into the scripting engine. So now we've got some ideas about things that are uh, open on that particular computer. And then we've got some information about the network. Now we need to start putting it together into something we can use. So creating a network diagram to show vulnerable or potentially vulnerable devices can be used to give us a target zone. We can say, hey, this is likely going to be a web server. This is likely going to be an FTP server. These can be things that we can exploit vulnerabilities on. And if we're trying to carry out a particular objective, they can tell us where we need to focus our attacks. So very much like identifying the network range back at the beginning of this lecture, this helps us to narrow our attacks even further. And there are toolkits from companies like SolarWinds, uh, Alvic, OpenAudIT, the Dude, Angry IP Scanner, uh, used Angry IP Scanner a lot, um, Spiceworks, Network Notepad. These are going to automatically be able to process information based on known fingerprints and known results that have already been self-reported. Um, manual maps can also be written out. You know, you can just jot down notes as you're going through certain responses. That is definitely more of an advanced level item, but I have known people that do that. So now we've got our probes. Scans are done. What services have been revealed? What ports do we know are open? Um, what systems are we trying to scan here? And we can go ahead and explore our vulnerabilities appropriately. Locate and research any potential exploits that can be used to attack the system. Uh, and then we can go through, you know, all kinds of different search engines. We can look in the, you know, for stuff specific to the Metasploit framework or uh, OSINT, things like that, and be able to find information about potential attacks. So we find the intersection of this is the particular operating system I have. These are the ports that are open. This is my intention. How can I leverage this combination to be successful as an attacker? And of course, you know, we're not always going to be acting as an attacker when we're in the ethical hacking world, but we have to start there because if we can't think like the person we're defending against, then we're going to be at a disadvantage. Just an example here. This is a list of vulnerabilities um, for Microsoft Internet and Information Services. So we can see here vulnerabilities for vendor, Microsoft, title, IIS, uh, version, and then you can select the one that's there. And you can see that there are date sorted uh, different vulnerabilities. You know, you've got denial of service, session renegotiation, which is part of hijacking, uh, remote security access, request smuggling. There's a lot of different vulnerabilities that are there. So this is just an example of how you can use a scan to be able to find out some information. So if you slide over to securityfocus.com, I'm sure you could um, find some interesting things even about your own system at home. Another thing you may have to deal with is what's called a ping sweep, which is part of the, the scan system being able to go through and find information based on sending pings in a range to a given set of devices. So we've got six primary countermeasures for ping sweeps, hardware based, you know, a hardware based firewall, um, software, you know, you can use things like Snort or other types of IPS or IDS software, auditing. You know, auditing should be a big part of your process anyway, making sure that you're evaluating traffic. If you just assume that the traffic that's passing through is legitimate, then you're going to end up disappointed, which it stinks because it's a lot of extra work in some cases, but that's what we get paid for. That's what we do. Uh, the kick, this is where we have any host that's performing more than 10 ICMP echoes. You know, obviously that number can be adjusted depending on the size of your organization. Uh, but in general, you know, there's a lot of predefined rules for um, IPS and IDS systems, be they hardware or software based, that will say if you have unusual traffic that falls into this set of parameters, automatic kick ban. Um, you'll see it on Google on occasion, especially if you're using a VPN door, it says you're seeing unusual traffic. Fill out this CAPTCHA, um, you know, those automated Turing tests. DMZs, um, not only should we use DMZs where we have the air gap in between well, not an air gap, but we have a, a separation between two firewalls or similar in which certain commands are, are only made accessible based on a previous set of rules. So echo reply, host unreachable, time exceeded. Those should only be accessible within the DMZ and should not penetrate the inner firewall so that that way people can't tell what's actually going on inside your network. Uh, you'll notice earlier with certain types of scans, it said that it was trying to bypass a firewall in order to find extra information. That's where that comes in. And then, of course, ACLs, uh, access control lists. You know, what do people have permissions to access? So if you have to have an ACL that allows external information being passed outwards, that would be considered sensitive. 
a static permission set would be that's really where it is you know think about it when your admin puts in a new user they have to go in and specify permissions usually based on a role but they have to specifically create that user so it's not like it's something that should be automatically generated if your isp has to contain certain information or be able to crawl certain information from your site create a static permission set in your acl for that Configure your firewall and IDS to be able to block and detect probes. Make sure your route and filter mechanisms can't be bypassed by source routing, which is where they manually type in a routing path. Um, make sure your firmware and software are patched. Now there is a, there's a big caveat to this. With firmware and software, I always say, give it a week. That's usually my situation. If it's anything major, if it is a minor update, usually you can do it within two days or so. I very rarely do zero day updates, which is, it seems ironic because zero day exploits are such a big thing. Um, but in general, I will go through the um, Windows Insider program on my personal machine and be able to explore what those updates are just to make sure there's not something that's going to throw a huge wrench. Um, you know, we see it all the time where, you know, a platform does an update and then all of a sudden there's this huge gaping hole because they didn't test properly. And that comes down to patch management. You know, you have to make sure that those updates are going to be vetted and revised and all that good stuff. Um, filter all your ICMP messages at the firewall and router levels. Um, ICMP messages should be very limited coming from outside. Um, you also want to make sure that you don't give them an excessive amount of permission inside either. Uh, honestly, it's easier just to restrict everything and then only turn on the stuff that you absolutely need. Be aware of spoofing. You know, somebody could pretend to be an internal source. Um, configure anti-scan and anti-spoof rules accordingly. So even if something's local traffic, make sure it's encrypted. Multi-layer firewalls, uh, ingress and egress filtering. As something enters or leaves your DMZ, make sure that there's stateful inspection going on in order to identify potential problems. Audit yourself with scan tools. You know, that should be, again, that should be part of anyone's uh, kit as an IT security specialist is if you can't test yourself, you're going to end up getting tested by someone else. And they usually aren't going to have the best of intentions. Turn off server banners, put up false banners if you have to. Um, any unnecessary services should be turned off. Um, any file extensions that show up on your web pages should be masked. There's several different ways to go through that. Um, there are IIS tools like Page Exchanger that can be used to help conceal information that might be considered sensitive. Uh, Server Mask is another tool we can use to try and hide banner information. In general, you want to make yourself look as generic as possible from the outside. So if somebody is going to try and access your network or anything else, you want them to get as little information as possible to where um, they consider that either your um, from an information standpoint, boring or not worth the effort required to break in. So what did we do today? Well, we did our identification process. We looked at how to identify target systems. We looked at some ports, vulnerability scans, as well as some network mapping tools. So um, hopefully you found it interesting. Hopefully you learned some stuff. Uh, definitely gonna have some interesting times with the, the chapter six labs, I'm sure. So if you have any questions or concerns, as always, contact me through my Google Voice number, through my email, through uh, Blackboard, leave a message here in the channel, uh, or just come on by the office. I'm always glad to see students. So um, hope you had a good one, and I will talk to you guys next class. Thank you so much.